Richthofen now had 80 victories. He'd been offered a ground job, but he knew his real value was propaganda, meant he had to keep flying. Flying in a war that could only offer one-way traffic. Most of it in khaki, all of it marching east. Flying in a war a world away from the one he'd enjoyed at Rukor just a year earlier. Flying in a war he knew would eventually claim him. I am in wretched spirits after every aerial battle. When I set foot on the ground, I go to my quarters and I do not want to see anyone or hear anything. I think of this war as it really is. Not as people at home imagine with a hurrah and a roar. It is very serious. Very grim. 21st of April, 1918. In two days' time, he'd be going off on leave. Busman's holiday, really, shooting in the Black Forest. Wild boar might turn a bit quicker than camels, but at least they didn't fire back. Two more days to survive. 21st of April, 1918. So here he is in his red Fokker triplane, a leave pass in his pocket, a whole world on his shoulders, and a date with Brownie's camels. The man, not the legend, was going off to die. Formations met. The inexperienced WAP May, with guns jammed, ran for home. Richthofen dived after him. May couldn't throw him off. Along the Somme Valley they roared. Then up into the mouths of the machine guns on Morlancourt Ridge. Still, a red plane came on. He was determined to get me. I was beginning to despair. Then, watching over my shoulder, I saw something so wonderful I couldn't believe it. The red plane rolled drunkenly and fell to the ground. Von Richthofen has not returned from the pursuit of an enemy over the Somme battlefield. According to an English report, he has fallen. I hope he roasted the whole way down. No prizes for guessing where this is. I'm on top of the Moreland Corps Ridge on the Bray Corby Road. Behind me, two miles away, is Corby. Down there, south, half a mile away, the River Somme. And across the valley, hidden in the morning mist, Le Hamel, then in German hands. Ten miles up this road is Cappy. And north of the road, just here, the brickworks. We're about 12 miles from Vertongle. The Red Baron didn't roast the whole way down. From a distance, it looked like a controlled, if clumsy, landing. The impact smashed the undercarriage and the prop. Richthofen was already dead. We're not entering the great debate, except to say we'll go with the evidence. Ground fire from Australians brought him down. It seems to me there's as much confusion about where he crashed as about who actually killed him. And that's strange. Here we have an aircraft on the ground from lunchtime till nightfall, visited by hundreds, the subject of high level interest in reports, and yet here we are, not really sure where the triplane fell. Most books put it north of the road. Who killed the Red Baron, for example, puts it here, just north of the road. Yet official reports and statements quoting trench map references don't agree. They all say west, not east of the brickworks. This is trench map 62D northeast. They agree on square 19. The position we've just seen is in square 20. The official reports at J19B, 5.2. Lieutenant George Travers, 52nd Battalion AIF, said 3.4. Intelligence officer Donald Fraser put it at 4.3. And Lieutenant Warnford, equipment officer of number three squadron, Australian Flying Corps, put it at 4.4. These map references represent areas 50 yards by 50 yards. Taking this evidence, Richthofen crashed west of the brickworks. The only question is, was it north or south of the road? 
The ground here, north of the road, begins to fall away from the crest of the ridge. And that's important. The Germans had a good sight of the triplane. If we believe what we read, they knew the pilot didn't climb out, and they put an accurate barrage around it to keep people away. We've marked the approximate front line on today's map. Across the valley, Le Hamel was in German hands. Was this roughly the view from Le Hamel that the German 16th Field Artillery had? If it was, then you realize the Germans wouldn't have been able to see the triplane north of the road. You can only just see the car. And that, plus the trench map references, makes a strong argument for south of the road. So, was it just down here that soldiers descended on it like locusts, ripping, pulling and squabbling over their spoils? And that's the irony. The man who collected the guns, engines and serial numbers of the aircraft he shot down. The man who awarded himself little silver cups for each of his victories until his jeweler ran out of silver. The great souvenir collector had become the souvenired. The souveniring went on after the wreck and body were brought back. The red Fokker triplane that landed virtually intact finished up like this. The cortege set off from three squadron Australian Flying Corps at Poulainville, heading for the village cemetery at Betongle, about a mile away. The funeral was late the following afternoon, on a sunny spring day. Lieutenant Warnford, who salvaged the wreck, was a pallbearer. Number three squadron, Australian Flying Corps, provided a firing party. Attacked at home for being too elaborate a burial for an enemy, and attacked in Germany as an act of hypocrisy, the Baron was laid to rest. By nightfall, the flowers had been scattered. This second cross souvenired like the first. After the war, the body was moved to a German cemetery, then, in 1925, taken home to Germany. But the story, and the souveniring, doesn't end there. In the 1960s, author P.J. Carousella came here a digging. He wanted the metal plate from the original coffin, which he thought was left in the empty plot after the first exhumation. So, he dug. He found the remains of a coffin. He found a pile of bones. But he didn't find the metal plate. Seventy plus years on, bits of the Baron, bits of the red Fokker triplane, still change hands with all the enthusiasm they did on April the 21st, 1918, atop the Morlancourt Ridge. But it's big money now. Even legends are prone to inflation. <laughs>